Aloha everyone and welcome back to Biology 101 here at Chaminade University. Today we will be delving into Unit 13 or the origin of species. We'll talk about what it means to be a species and then we'll talk about reproductive isolation between species and how that's maintained. Then we'll talk about speciation or the creation of new species and we'll talk about extinction and extinctive events. So we touched on Darwin in the last lecture, but some of the Darwinian ideas we presented did not fully explain the diversity of life. In fact, the process of natural selection alone is not quite enough to ex explain how living things are divided into so many different groups. So each species is subjected to independent selective pressure and therefore evolves independently. And again, a species is defined as a group of populations that evolves independently. Each species follows a separate path, evolutionarily speaking, because alleles very rarely move between one gene pool of one species to another. Um, and the standard definition of species is groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations, which are reproductively isolated from other groups. Remember, it all comes down to whether or not you can interbreed. So the biological species concept is based on the idea that reproductive isolation, which isolation would just be that you're unable to breed um, outside of that group. And that's going to ensure that that group um, evolves independent of other groups, so that it ensures evolutionary independence of that population, which can lead to speciation. Now, there are two limitations to that original biological species concept. Um, and the definition is based on the patterns of sexual reproduction, so it doesn't really help us with species that... Um, are sexually reproducing, so it doesn't necessarily help dis determine boundaries between reproducing organisms that do have sexual behavior that they can interbreed, but they still have differences between them. And it's not always practical to determine whether species are able to interbreed or whether they actually do interbreed. So the potential for interbreeding isn't necessarily the same thing as interbreeding. Um, additionally, just to confound the issue, the appearances of these organisms can be misleading. So sometimes organisms appear similar, but belong to two different species entirely, such as these different flycatchers called the Cordillian flycatcher and the Pacific slope flycatcher, and most bird watchers can't tell them apart. For a very long time, they were considered to be a single species, but it was recently revealed that they do not interbreed, and in fact are two entirely different species even though there's no visible difference between them. Um, another place that there's no visible difference between are different types of um, mosquitoes. So the Anphelicidiris and Anphelicidis uh, harrisoni um, is very crucial a difference actually is that one is able to spread malaria and the other is not. So even though they look identical, one of them is deadly and the other is not. So this is an example of the flycatchers. You can see there's very, very slight similar or differences, very overall very similar organisms, so similar that most bird watchers are unable to tell them apart phenotypically. Um, another example of a misleading appearance is that a butterfly was considered to be a single species for over 200 years, and now it's known to be 10 separate species. They look very similar, but they do not interbreed. So just because they have differences in appearance in the population, that doesn't necessarily always indicate that they belong to different species. So sometimes you have populations that um, appear to be very different, but are all able to interbreed. For example, the garter snakes could be brown, black, gray, green, or any shade in between, and still able to interbreed with each other. They can be striped or unstriped. The stripes can be broad or narrow. So my point is that they have quite the diversity and a lot of different phenotypes, but they all belong to the same species. So it's really difficult to draw the distinction between these different species. So for in this case, these members are the same species, but they look quite different. This one's green striped and this one's red striped. Um, and uh, this all comes down to whether or not organisms are able to interbreed. So if organisms are not able to interbreed, then we have reproductive isolation. And anything that maintains that reproductive isolation, those are called isolating mechanisms. Now, isolating mechanisms do have a benefit in that we end up with no offspring that are unfit or unsterile, so no hybrids. And they are going to help prevent a lot of energy that's going into reproduction, so for the organism, the, the, the maternal or paternal organism. Um, it, it's a lot of effort to create offspring, and if you're going to create an offspring that's a hybrid that fails to contribute to the future generations, it's a kind of a waste of that reproductive effort. And so natural selection helps to favor these traits that prevent reproduction across species boundaries. In this way, we can maintain reproductive isolation.
Now we have a whole different series of reproductive isolation. The first type are pre-mating isolating mechanisms. So these are mechanisms that prevent two organisms from two different species from physically mating. And they include things like geographic isolation, ecological isolation, etc. And we'll go through each of these independently. Additionally, we have post-mating isolating mechanisms. And these are factors that are going to prevent the organisms from producing offspring after they've mated. So they're not going to prevent the mating event themselves, but they're going to prevent the creation of viable offspring. For example, we could have um, sperm that cannot fertilize the egg. Or we can have a hybrid offspring that may implant but fail to come to term, so hybrid inviability. Or we could have offspring that do come to term, like a lion and a tiger making a liger, but they're going to have no fertility, so be sterile or have very low fertility, if any. So there's multiple different isolating mechanisms that create reproductive isolation. Again, the pre-mating isolating mechanisms is anything that prevents mating between species. So this means that we're not going to get to the point of actually having a physical mating event occur. The first is that we can have geographical isolation, and that means that the populations can't physically come in contact with one another because they live in physically separate spaces in different locations. This type of isolating mechanism is usually a mechanism that allows speciation events to occur. Um, generally, these species are going to be forming from um, one population that might have ended up on one side of a barrier uh, from another population that's on the other side of the barrier. So new species can form on either side. So this actually generally tends to be something that leads to speciation rather than one that merely maintains reproductive isolation amongst two species. This is, an example of a geographic isolation. These two squirrels live in the same habitat, but this one lives mainly on the ground and that one mainly in the branches. So even though they could possibly physically interbreed, they're never in the same location in the habitat at the same time. Um, and some other examples of ecological isolation basically would be that you're occupying two different habits within the region, habitats within the region. An example of this would be sparrows that are white crowned versus white throated. The white crowned sparrows inhabit fields and meadows and white-throated sparrows inhabit dense thickets. So although they might be in the same overall location, several sets of square miles, they're not going to be located in the same region within the habitat. So they have ecological isolation, not geographical isolation. Another example of that would be fig wasps. Now fig wasps are very special because fig wasps actually always go back to breed at the same type of tree from which they were born. Um, and so if they were bred in one type of fig, they're going to come back to that, whereas a different species is bred in a different type. And so the wasps are never going to come in contact with one another because they breed in the fruit of different species of figs. Right? That guy looks like a very friendly person to have in your house. Um, but that is a fig wasp. Another mechanism of pre-mating is reproductive isolation is something called a temporal isolation and time-based isolation. Basically what means is that means that those two species are going to have different breeding seasons. One breeds, for example, in the spring versus the fall, or one's nocturnal and one's diurnal. So they, have, they might occupy the same habitat, but they're never going to be in the same breeding zone at the same time. Um, an example of that includes the bishop pine and the monterey pine. They're not able to interbreed because although they are found in the same forest at the same location, pollination of the bishop pine occurs in the summer, whereas monterey pine pollination occurs in the early spring, and so they're never able to cross-pollinate one another. Here's the bishop and the monterey pine. They do look very similar. They're found in the same location, but again, because of temporal isolating mechanisms, they're never able to reproduce. Um, we also have behavioral isolation, and this basically is something that occurs based on some sort of behavioral mechanism that differs from one species to another. And that can be courtship colors or courtship rituals, etc. An example of this is the Ragania bird of paradise. It's a very conspicuous species. It has large plumes and a kind of ridiculous looking pose. It's called an arresting pose. And there's very little chance that females of any other species will mate with him by mistake, right? He has a very odd... Um, characteristics and it's very clear that this is this particular species and so this would be considered a behavioral isolation or a mating or courtship ritual in which species of one well individuals of one species would not mate with individuals of another species um, another example of behavioral mechanism is uh, in frogs so male frogs are um, not picky they embrace any female no matter what frog species that female is, and a female frog is going to encounter a male of either the same species and allow that mating attempt to occur, or if it occurs a male of a different species, she's going to utter what's called a release call, which makes the male let go of her. 
and that's going to result in few hybrid or offspring, which would be offspring of parents of different species. Um, another pre-mating isolating mechanism would be if we have oddly shaped sexual organs, and I consider this like a, um, a bulldog and a chihuahua, right? If you have um, sexual organs that are just never going to line up. For example, um, animals with internal fertilization where the male and, sexual, male and female organs simply do not fit together, so copulation cannot occur. Sometimes we can have incompatible body shapes, right? A very, very tiny dog and a very, very large dog are never going to be able to have species interbreeding. Um, another example here that's a little more specific would be a specific subtype of snails. And in this species of snails, the shells have either a left-handed spiral or a right-handed spiral. And those with a left-handed spiral are unable to copulate successfully with those that have the, um, the opposite spiral. We can also have mechanical incompatibility. And mechanical incompatibility would happen if your reproductive structures simply are incompatible with one another. Um, and we can have that post-mating isolating mechanisms that occur after mating attempts have occurred that can still limit the offspring that are created. And we can have that by limiting the hybrid offspring. We do that by, um, this is going to occur after pre-mating isolating mechanisms have failed. Um, and so we could have a mating attempt actually occur. However, a post-mating isolating mechanism can make it that we either have hybrid um, inviability or hybrid um, infertility. So we can have incompatibility at the gametic level, and that means that sperm and egg of these species are not able to fertilize one another. For example, animals with internal fertilization might have specific fluids in the female tract that are going to weaken or kill sperm of a species that is not going to be um, considered viable for fertilization. Um, another example would be something like a marine invertebrate or wind-pollinated plants where they reproduce by scattering their gametes into the water or into the air and then kind of hoping for the best. And this is when gametic incompatibility is going to become very important as an isolating mechanism for these species because in this way they're only going to be able to reproduce once they reach a gamete of the correct species. For example, sea urchin sperm has a specialty protein on it, and it can be released into the water, but it will only bind to eggs of the sea urchin species. So that specialty protein means that the sperm and the egg of the sea urchin are, even though they might be in water with sperm and egg of multiple other species, are only ever going to be able to bind to one another. Another example would be chemical incompatibility among plants whereby the pollen of one species that lands on the flower of another species would be prevented from germinating because of chemical incompatibility. That would basically mean that the sperm and the egg fail to fertilize one another. If, however, we end up with fertilization event occurring, oftentimes that leads to hybrid inviability. And what that means is that the hybrid will not come to term, or if they do come to term, will not last very long, certainly won't last to reproductive age. That's called hybrid inviability. And if the hybrid does come to term, and does um, have the ability to, it's going to generally be infertile. So if it's going to survive to reproductive age, something like a mule, for example, or a liger, so a mule is a cross between a horse and a donkey, and a liger is a cross between a lion and a tiger. And in this case, a liger is very specific. Only a male lion and a female tiger are able to make a liger. A female lion-male tiger combination does not work. But in this case, although we are able to make an or an individual, that individual is going to be infertile. So hybrids are unable to pass on their genetic material to the offspring. So that's going to be a mechanism of blocking gene flow between the two parental populations. Um, and the infertility of the hybrid offspring is generally due to the failure of the chromosomes to prayer properly during meiotic events, as we saw previously with meiosis. It's a very specific lineup of the chromosomes. And so that means that the sperm and the egg generally don't develop properly in something like a liger. Aren't they beautiful? Don't we all want one now? All right, so the mechanism of speciation, or the creation of two species from one, depends on two major processes. The first is isolation. We have to make it that the two species are no longer sharing their genes between one another. And secondarily, we have to have genetic divergence. And that means that the two populations have to be subjected to different environmental selective pressures. That means that we end up with a change in the allelic frequencies from one generation to the next. Again, the isolation of the population has to occur, and it can occur from multiple different ways. But basically, what we want to do is block gene flow and interbreeding from one population to the other. After that, we have to have genetic divergence of the populations. And again, that occurs through those isolating mechanisms that we just talked about. And from there, 
we have natural selection or genetic drift or other mechanisms that might affect the allelic frequency from generation A to generation B. Now we have two major types of speciation events. The first is allopatric speciation and the second is sympatric speciation, both of which evolve because of isolating mechanisms, but in allopatric speciation the isolating mechanism is physical, whereas in sympatric speciation the isolating mechanism occurs without geographical separation, so it's behavioral or temporal or something other than physical. Now when species arise by allopatric speciation, that basically generally occurs because there's an impassable barrier between two different populations, or what was originally one population that then got separated, so different parts of the population separate into two. Um, and an example of this is when organisms colonize very isolated habitats very far out to sea, for example, and that can allow separate populations to occur. Also we can have a factors such as volcanoes or earthquakes that change the, the um, geography that surrounds the populations, leading to the separation of the populations. Um, allopatric speciation, again, that occurs because of natural selection and genetic drift, which occurs when we end up with a physical separation um, between two populations. And it's the most common type of speciation, especially among animals. So allopatric isolation and divergence. These guys are going to, this is a founder effect, essentially these lizards leave, get on a log, go from island A to island B. Island B has a different set of um, environmental and selective pressure, and so over time these guys become a little bit more brown, whereas these stay green. And eventually the divergence is such that we have reproductive isolation between the two so that these individuals can no longer interbreed, and that actually is the cause of, or that's the definition of speciation. All right, so allopatric speciation again occurs and we have a physical barrier that can be geological, it can be climate, or anything that is going to cause a divide between two populations. For example, if we have an increase in sea level, now we had a population that was on a coastal hilltop that used to be able to get back and forth from one side to another, and now we end up with two islands instead that's gonna isolate those two populations. Um, another example would be a volcanic eruption. Um, that splits a population, or a river changes course that divides a population in half, or continental drift, etc. Anything that is a physical barrier can lead to allopatric speciation. And if the two populations become isolated geographically, we end up with no gene flow between them, and if we have different environments on the two locations, then natural selection can allow different traits to become more prevalent in the different locations. Again, that's going to lead to a change in allelic frequencies, and eventually that can lead to the point where we have genetic divergence between the two populations such that they're no longer able to interbreed. So if we have separated populations that um, have differences between them, that allows for genetic drift and genetic differences between the two, um, and that geographic isolation followed by a speciation, allopatric speciation, is the most common source of new species on the planet. Um, and again, this occurs because we have some sort of isolation events. Now we can have genetic isolation without geographic separation. And if that occurs, we end up with sympatric isolation. And sympatric isolation can occur if we have isolation of the two populations, for example, ecological isolation, etc., that reduces gene flow between the populations even though we don't have any sort of physical barrier. Um, for example, species that um, occupy two different habitats of the same geographical area. Um, so eventually they end up sufficiently de genetically different so they can no longer interbreed and that, occur that allows for speciation. Um, an example of this are fruit flies that are evolved into two separate species or in the process of evolving into two separate species. Um, and they're basically parasites that live in the American hawthorn tree. And the example of ecological isolation is when one population lays its eggs in the hawthorn fruit of one type of tree, apples, and one that breeds in the hawthorn type of tree. Um, so basically one population is laying its eggs in hawthorn fruit, and then that's the fruit that the maggots eat once they hatch. Um, but we also have a separate population that's breeding on apples as opposed to hawthorns. And because female flies tend to go back to the same fruit in which they develop to lay their eggs, and males also tend to prefer the same type of fruit in which they develop to be able to find females, the apple flies and the hawthorn flies, hawthorn flies, no longer interbreed. And that means that over time, these two populations 
are going to separate out into apple liking males and apple liking females and hawthorn liking males and hawthorn liking females and because apples and hawthorn fruits mature approximately two to three weeks apart now we have a separation of timing as well when the flies emerge from their chosen fruit and that's going to mean that these two types of flies no longer have any chance of meeting and so this is an example of sympatric isolation and divergence. So the fruit flies actually have different preferential mating choices to preferentially mate either on the apple or the hawthorn tree, and so the populations are diverging. And over time, we can also end up with sympatric speciation by mutation events. New species can arise almost instantaneously if multiple mutation events occur that change, for example, the number of chromosomes in their cell or something very drastic for those individuals. And an example of multiple copies of a chromosome inside the cell is called polypoidy. And that's a very frequent cause of sympatric speciation as well. For example, polyploid individuals can't mate with diploid individuals, and diploid individuals can't mate with polyploid individuals. And so we have genetic isolation from the parental species based on the number of chromosomes inside the cells of the organism. Then polyploid plants are more likely than polyploid animals to be able to reproduce because in a polyploid animal population, um, that's generally not going to be something that's going to be able to be passed on to the next generation. But it's something that's very common in plants, for example, strawberries, etc. So when we did our DNA isolation, we I said you should use strawberries or kiwis. Because they are polyploid, that means that they have more chromosomes inside their cells than most um, other organisms. All right, so let's talk about speciation now in the terms of an evolutionary tree. So if we think about the history of life, we think about organisms going from one species to the next to the next, right? And that can be similar to something called an evolutionary tree, similar to something like a family tree if you were to consider your genealogy. And if you think of it as the base of the evolutionary tree being the earliest organisms, and they branch off into smaller and smaller branches representing all of today's species that are alive on the planet today. And there's tons of hypotheses and discoveries about the evolutionary relationships among these species, and generally they're communicated by depicting different portions of life in terms of these evolutionary trees, as I mentioned. Um, now, sometimes we have events that occur where a lot of speciation can occur all at once. So because mechanisms of speciation and reproductive um, isolation occur sometimes for multiple species at the same time, we can end up with forking branches of the evolutionary tree of life. And that's called adaptive radiation, when we have multiple different forks that come off of the branches at the same time. For example, if we have a previously undiscovered habitat, and then we have a, a, several species that ex go into that habitat, and each of them find specific niches in which they are likely to survive, then we can have multiple different speciation events occurring at the same time. And that's what adaptive radiation is, basically the rise of multiple species over a relatively short period of time because of some sort of change in environmental pressure. The process generally occurs when a species invades a habitat or a variety of new habitats, a location that has many habitats, that has very few competitors. An example of that is the colonization of the, French, the finch population in the Galapagos Islands, which resulted in 13 separate species of finch. Or the cichlid populations um, in Lake Malawai, which resulted in over 300 species of cichlid pop fish. We also have a tarweed plant in the Hawaiian Islands. You may recognize the silver sword, which is our chaminade mascot, as a tarweed plant, or as a one species of the tarweed plant. We have over 30 separate species here in the Hawaiian Islands. So here's a normal evolutionary tree where we have a fork, we have a split. We start off with one ancestor, it divides into two. That ancestor divides into two and divides into two, etc. That happens over relatively, um, maybe not exactly equal, but over relatively lengthy periods of time. That's a normal evolutionary tree, but sometimes we have an event, a selective event, where we have a population that gets introduced to a new habitat where we have no competition. And so that's called adaptive radiation when multiple different species arise from one progenitor all at once. Um, so multiple speciation events arise rapidly enough that we can't actually be certain which arose in what order. So here's an example of ad adaptive radiation. Here's our Ahina Hina, or the silver sword that you might be very familiar with. But other types of this um, species of these plants include the Wailele um, uh, Jubachia and the Na'ene E Ula. I apologize if I butcher the Hawaiian names here, but these are other types of what I just mentioned is the tarweed plant that colonized the Hawaiian islands. Um, all right, so for a second I wanna talk about something a little bit extreme, um, extinction. When all of the members of a particular species die out, 
and multiple different sets. So if I go back just a second and I look at these different evolutionary trees, um, most of these different forks on an evolutionary tree are going to lead to dead ends. Um, and so when something goes completely extinct, that's considered uh, all of the members of the species that have died off. And approximately 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. And almost always the immediate cause of extinction is environmental change, whether it's something that's um, external to the environment, something like the temperature change, et cetera, or something like a predator that's been introduced or another species that outcompetes it for its resources. All of these are environmental changes, and that can lead to extinction, including things like habitat destruction and competition amongst species. Now, some species can be particularly vulnerable to extinctive events because they have very, very specialized distribution. For example, a specific fish called the Devil's Hole Pupfish is found only in one water hole in the Nevada desert. So this species is only found in one habitat in the entire world. And if that habitat diminishes, a drought or well or drilling, that pupfish will immediately vanish, never to be seen again. Whereas species that inhabit a wide range of habitats normally don't succumb to local environmental catastrophes. So they're not as, um, as vulnerable of a population. This is what the pupfish looks like here. Sometimes a species can end up over-specialized, and that is going to also increase its risk of extinction if, for example, it feeds only on one particular type of plant, like the blue butterfly, the Carner blue butterfly, feeds only on the blue lupine plant. So if the habitat of the lupine plant has been reduced, which it has by development, then the loss of the lupine will lead to the loss of the blue butterfly. So it's kind of like a hand-in-hand, -hand, a cascade event. You lose one species, you lose the other automatically as well. This is just a, a beautiful example of the of the plant that we were just talking about, the Carner Blue Butterfly and the Lupine. So that's just kind of a demonstration of the fact that species interact with other species and competition with other species can, or predation by other species, can drive a species to extinction. So these are going to serve as agents of natural selection, but if, because remember, in order for natural selection to lead to adaptation, we have to have an individual in the population that has, so we have to have variety in the population to be able to have at least one individual that has the allelic um, combination necessary to rise to the adaptive challenge. So if we don't have that, natural selection can lead to extinction of events. So anytime a species is unable to exploit their resources as efficiently or more efficiently than their competitors, that can lead to an extinctive event. Sometimes we can end up with species that are isolated based on or are given access to regions where they weren't previously given access to. So an isolated barrier can be removed. For example, approximately 3 million years ago, here it says the Isthmus of Panama rose above sea level. And I hate the way that's written because the Isthmus stayed still and the sea level dropped. Um, but because of the drop in sea level, an Isthmus of Panama arose and formed a land bridge between North and South America. And that meant that North American species could come down into South American species. And North American species were hardier. And they were able to displace the vast majority of South American species over just a couple generations, leading to a mass extinction of multiple South American species. And I don't want to lead us on, leave us on a very depressing note, but unfortunately, most of the ha present habitat destruction occurs because of human activities, such as clearing of all our tropical rainforests. And if we continue to clear tropical rainforests at the rate at which we are doing so, it could lead to the loss of up to half of the current species in as little as 50 years. So we really do have to do something to stave off um, habitat loss and destruction in order to help maintain the biodiversity on the planet. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for listening to us. I will see you next time. Happy studying and aloha.